Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. We've been teaching on reaching the lost and I've been showing you over the course of these programs how to engage with the lost, how to preach the gospel to them, how to win friends amongst unbelievers and to demonstrate Christ to them and earn the right to share your faith with them. And over the course of the programs, I pray that you've been encouraged as you've seen how that God is with you in this process. It's part of the mission that is given to us, a central part of the mission, to preach the gospel to all creation and to make disciples of all nations. We've seen how important it is to call people to commit their lives to Christ and to follow through on that commitment by a life of discipleship. And so, as believers who are concerned to win people to Jesus, we're also concerned to disciple them in the faith, to see Christ formed into their lives. We spoke a great deal recently about the Holy Spirit and how important it is to depend upon the Holy Spirit, not just in our preaching, but to depend upon the Holy Spirit to change people's lives. Because only by the Holy Spirit can somebody be born again and find new life in Christ. Now in today's program we're going to talk about evangelism and prayer. And this in some ways is a very familiar topic. All of us who have people as friends or family members and close associates who don't know Jesus, we have a burden for them. We long for them to come to faith in Christ. Sometimes it's not always easy to communicate that to them. Maybe they're a bit closed to it, or maybe they're a bit too close to us, and it's difficult. But the Holy Spirit can help us, especially as we pray. I find that when I pray, my mind becomes more sensitive to the will of God. I find that I become more open to what God wants me to do. And so for many believers, we begin in relation to evangelism and prayer by praying for ourselves, asking God to put upon our hearts a real burden for the lost. It's not enough just to pray for people, they must also hear the gospel. And in order for them to hear the gospel, there must be workers and laborers sent out into the harvest field. That means you and me. Jesus taught us to pray like this. He said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to raise up and send laborers into the harvest field. And I find that when I pray for the harvest field, God reminds me that I'm also a worker. And also when we seek the face of God for and on behalf of others who don't yet know Jesus, He gives us a deeper love for them than we can ever imagine. The Holy Spirit works in our hearts through prayer to have a real burden for the lost. This is the great passion of the life of Jesus Christ. The death of Jesus is also called His passion and how appropriate. Not only was it a, a time of suffering for Him, it was a time of demonstrating that He had real passion for the lost. He laid down His life as the Good Shepherd for the sheep that they might be saved and be drawn through His love through the cross to a relationship with God. So when we get down to the business of teaching about prayer and evangelism. I pray that your heart would be opened for the Holy Spirit to come through prayer to give you a deeper burden than you've ever ever had for those people who don't yet know Jesus Christ, the people around you, in your family, your friends, your neighbors, your work colleagues, and by prayer God will give you wisdom in reaching them for Jesus. Hello everybody and welcome back to this final session on reaching the lost. We've covered a lot of material over all the last sessions and, and uh, I want to encourage you to go back over the material often, frequently, to get all of this knowledge deep in your spirit so that you can live it out and practice it. Of course we've just been talking in a lecture classroom type of situation but this has to be enacted out and lived out in your life. In the final session we're going to deal with the topic of prayer, evangelism and prayer. Surely everything that I have talked to you about over these last 11 sessions has been building up to the need for us to combine evangelism with prayer. As we pray and seek the face of God, 
our hearts are attuned to the Father's great passion, which is evangelism. As we pray, the Holy Spirit will lead us and direct us to the needs of the lost and to the concerns of the lost and give us the revelation concerning how we might reach them so our hearts might be full of the, of the burden of God and the burden of the Holy Spirit. Now, one of the first things we, we notice when we look at this topic of evangelism and prayer is that most people think that Jesus spends a lot of time teaching about praying for the lost. He doesn't. In fact, he never calls us to pray for the harvest. The harvest is not the problem. He says rather, pray for the laborers. That the laborers will go out there because the harvest is plentiful, the harvest is ripe, but the laborers are few. And a lot of praying for evangelism is about praying that this person will come to Christ and that person will come to Christ and so forth. And I, I suppose I don't want to talk against that. But it's not where our major emphasis should be. Our emphasis should be in clearing the obstacles that remain in us to deal with our hearts so that we will go out and reach the lost. Because simply praying that people get saved isn't going to save them. Because it doesn't happen that way. It happens by an evangelist. It happens by a believer. Somebody communicating the message of the gospel. The angels aren't going to pop out of heaven and do the preaching for us. We must get out there and do the preaching. And therefore praying on this topic of evangelism is much more to do with going out and reaching them, reaching the lost, than it is about praying for the lost in and of themselves. Now of course We've been talking about how evangelism requires dependence on the Holy Spirit. And when we pray, we depend on the Holy Spirit. Of course, one of the main ways that we show our faith in the power of the Holy Spirit is by prayer. Prayer is the most eloquent testimony you have to your belief in a supernatural God. That you can pray to a God that you don't see, who will therefore affect and change things that you can see, is, is a great testimony and faith in prayer. We also need to understand that when we are evangelizing, we are fighting against spiritual beings and demonic forces. And so we need to be covered in the armor of God. And to, the chief purpose of that covering is that we might engage in prayer. In Ephesians 6, 18, having just described this great armor that God has given to us, he says, praying with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And so the purpose of the armor is to clothe you and to prepare you for your life of prayer. Prayer in the Holy Spirit. We know that the armor is the armor of God. It's the armor that God himself possesses in which he himself uses to get the victory for himself. It's taken from Isaiah chapter 59 verses 15 to 19. And there Isaiah says that the Lord was so appalled that there was nobody to intercede that he decided himself to intervene. And, and before he interceded, he put on his personal armor. That is the divine armor which the Spirit provides for us when we pray in the Spirit. So this is all about intercessory equipment. The armor of God is there to protect us and to keep us in that place of prayer. The purpose of the armor is that we might be kept and protected in prayer. And so the Apostle Paul says, I want you to pray for me that when I preach, I will proclaim the word of God fearlessly and boldly as I should. He knew it was foolish to try and evangelize without supported prayer. Oh, and which was spirit-inspired prayer, of course. Spirit-enabled prayer. Spirit-equipped prayer. Spirit-empowered prayer. And in 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 to 5, he, he underlines the importance of this. Paul says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity into the obedience of Christ. Now, of course, in this context, the Apostle Paul is talking about the wrong teaching which is exalting itself against Christ, bringing every thought, every teaching, every doctrine captive to the obedience of Christ. He's talking about false teachers and those who've, who have gone astray in, in various ways. But behind this, 
There are spiritual forces that are leading people away from their pure devotion to Christ. And so when Paul says, I am dealing with these arguments in my teaching, in my preaching, in my evangelizing, he says, I am doing it in the self-conscious knowledge that this is a spiritual battle and I'm pulling down strongholds of the enemy by proclaiming the truth in the power of the Holy Spirit. One of the favorite prayers that I pray before I preach is, Lord, give me to, to speak today spiritual truths in spiritual words. Words given by the Holy Spirit. Utterance given so that when I preach and proclaim the word, then the word of God is flowing in my, in my mouth by the power of the Holy Spirit. And this isn't going to happen without intercession. As we pray, the Holy Spirit enables us to proclaim. So we need to look at evangelistic praying, and, and, and by this I mean praying concerning all the issues of the lost, orientating our prayer life towards the lost. The New Testament reveals the Apostle Paul was nothing if he was not a man of prayer. His letters are filled with prayers for his readers, requests for prayer from his readers or by his readers. Many of his letters are prayer requests, please pray for me, pray for me as well as full of teaching about prayer itself. Now in the manual Effective Prayer I deal with many of these things. I want to touch on some of them again now to bring this to conclusion in this session. You see the scriptures show us that Paul was passionate about evangelism and therefore we would not be surprised, should not be surprised to find that Paul is constantly calling for people to pray for him so that effective prayer will happen in his life and to teach them how to pray effectively so that evangelism will take place. In Romans 10 verse 1, Paul describes his desire for the Jews. He says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. In other words, he prayed evangelistically in dealing with uh, the situation with the Jews because his great passion was to see the Jews saved. Now, of course, this passage says nothing much about the content of Paul's praying. Rather, it reveals the purpose of his praying. That's what I mean when I talk about evangelistic praying. I'm talking about the purpose of prayer here is to see the lost saved. It's not just standing saying, Lord, sa save the lost. But everything that we pray is orientated towards this great goal of the Great Commission. And that's what should characterize our prayer life more than anything else. If the last word of Jesus is our first concern, if the Great Commission is not to become the great omission in our lives, then we must orientate everything that we do, including our prayer life, towards seeing that Great Commission take place, to seeing it fulfilled. And so, one of the main ways that Paul would have prayed, surely, would have been to have interceded for the obstacles preventing his evangelism, to, uh, so that those obstacles would be removed. And so that he would be equipped and effectively energized and mobilized and motivated for his life of ministry and witness. And so, if we are longing for somebody to be saved, we must wrestle in prayer for that person, for this salvation to come about. And this means we'll spend sometimes perhaps long hours praying with the purpose that that person will be saved. We will pray uh, for effective ways for that salvation to come to them. And uh, it seems to me that there are two main ways in which we could be praying like this. We need to pray that the gospel will be preached through an effective witness. We need to pray for heralds to be motivated, empowered and equipped. Lord, I pray that you will raise up in this person's life an effective witness. And it might be, surely, <laughs> you will become the answer to that prayer in most instances. You will be the effective witness. So you're saying, Lord, effectively equip me to be a witness to this person. Then secondly, you will pray for the obstacles blocking that person's salvation to be removed. Prayers for equipping, first of all. The Apostle Paul asked for prayer that he would be kept safe that he be rescued in a situation that was preventing the proclamation of the gospel. For example, he asked to be prayed that he be rescued from evil men, to be rescued from unbelievers. You have the references there before you and you can check them out for yourself. On one occasion he prayed to be rescued from a deadly peril, to be kept safe in prison, to be released from prison as a special favor, uh, uh, that a closed door would be opened. And so, here, in all these verses, 
Paul is asking for prayer, not for personal safety and security. It sounded like that, didn't it? But if you go back to each and every one of these contexts, you will see that in all these verses, Paul is asking for prayer and for safety and protection that he might be preserved as a witness in that situation. And this is how Paul judged his whole life. This is the single criterion by which he judged his life. How effective am I now, right, right now for the gospel? So he said, I want you Philippians to know, don't worry about me in prison. Please don't worry about me. I want you to know that what has happened to me has turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. That because I'm here, many now are calling upon the name of Jesus. In fact, through these soldiers that are, who are having to guard me, even now in the Praetorium Guard, and even amongst Caesar's household there are those who are talking about Jesus. They all know that I'm here for the defense of the gospel. They know I've had an effective witness. And he says, and what's more, some of those ignoble uh, fellows and, and, and gospel preachers have been emboldened by my chains. Some of them have said, well, Paul's finished and they are using that against me now and they're preaching the gospel out of false motives. Others are doing it out of pure motives, saying Paul is tied up quite literally now. We had better do something about this. But he says, I rejoice because whether from false motives or from true motives, it, it, it doesn't much matter. Christ at least is being preached and, I, and I'm so happy about that. And so he judges everything by this. How effective am I being now for the gospel? And this should be our overriding prayer concern. Dear God, make me effective witness. Now this happens sometimes, uh, and uh, I know a, a man who's high up and a former MP who is now beginning to serve an 18-month prison sentence because he uh, had uh, committed some, some crime. And that man has come back to the Lord and he is going to prison looking forward to the opportunity to witness to Christ in prison. And he is, when he's coming out of prison, going straight into Bible school, straight into training to become uh, a minister. And so he's using his situation. Sometimes when for some reason which is beyond our understanding, sickness comes upon us and Jesus doesn't seem to be healing us and we end up in hospital, remember there's somebody in the bed next to you who needs Jesus. Judge everything that happens to you as a means and opportunity to be a witness for Jesus Christ and that will occupy your prayer life. Help me Lord, equip me to be an effective witness for you in this situation. Effective prayer to become effective witnesses. And we should not therefore be sidetracked by these events and saying, Oh Lord, poor me, I'm in this terrible situation. I'm imprisoned by this circumstance. And you have a weepy, moany, self-little, self-centered, self-pity party that nobody else comes to. And it's very boring. You're the only, only person there. And instead of doing that, saying, Lord Jesus, I'm in a pickle right now. This situation's appalling. Rescue me in it. But most important of all, I want to be a victorious witness to you in this situation. Then we find passages where the Apostle Paul is requesting prayer that his message should be well received by unbelievers. Now this is much more than saying, oh Lord, save my husband, oh Lord, save that person. It's, it's now opening the door in the Spirit to the opportunity for the gospel to be preached effectively. Lord, I pray that when that person hears the gospel tonight in this meeting, that their heart will be opened, that they will receive the message. 2 Thessalonians 3 verses 1 and 2 say, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you, that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men for all not have faith. That seems to be one of the great un uh, underst understatements of the Bible, for not all have faith. So Paul says, I want to be kept in this, that the word of God would not be hindered, but I want the word of God to have free course. And so he asks for prayer to be fearless and to be bold. Ephesians 6 verses 19 and 20, Paul says, And pray for me that utterance may be given to me. And you need to pray this, Lord, when I witness, I pray that you give me utterance. Give me the words to say. And oh, you know the spirit of witness is upon you. When you suddenly say something, you say, where did that come from? And the Holy Spirit says, you ought to know where that came from. That came from me. Keep on going. You're doing all right. Uh, pray for me, Paul says, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Paul prayed for fearless, boldless proclamation. 
He knew his normal state was fear and trembling. He knew that boldness did not come naturally to him. Do you know, I find that God uses fearful people most powerfully in evangelism. Those people who are in fear and trembling. We think sometimes of the folk who are standing on street corners or preaching the gospel in all kinds of alarming situations, that they were always like that. Oh, it's okay for them, it's natural to them. It's not. It's not. Many of the great evangelists were fearful in and of themselves, tongue-tied folk who were, who were shy, and yet God's Spirit came upon them and they threw away their shyness and they said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel with boldness, repent or perish. Jesus is alive. Hallelujah. Now, as well as boldness, we need wisdom. All right? So we need the utterance. The utterance is not just to give you the freedom to speak. It's, it's to give you the words to speak. It's to give you the wise words that will be the keys that will unlock the hearts of the unbelievers in that situation. Paul asked people to pray especially for him in his journey to Rome. He wanted to come to Rome and bring a blessing and to preach powerfully and for the doors to be opened. And so these prayer requests offer great guidance for us as to how we're to pray for the lost. We know it's God's will for people to be saved. We do not need to persuade God, a reluctant God, to save them because it's God's idea. He's not willing that any should perish and all come to a knowledge of the truth. But we instead should pray that we are strengthened to overcome any imprisoning circumstances which prevent our witness. We need to pray that we are filled with boldness to speak God's word. We are to pray that we're given opportunities to witness and boldness to take them when the opportunities come. I think there's more opportunities than boldness in many, time, in many occasions. We need to pray that our words will be empowered by the Spirit and accepted by the believers. We need to acknowledge that they cannot receive those words. The natural mind cannot accept the things of the Spirit of God. It needs to come by revelation. That's what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1. He says, when I preached the gospel to you, the word didn't come in word only, it came in full conviction and in much assurance. In other words, as I spoke, the Holy Spirit took my words and applied them to your heart and brought you to conviction in your life. So we need to pray that our words would be empowered and would be accepted by the listeners. We need to also pray that the Spirit will convict our listeners of their sin and their need so that when we preach something happens and Paul rejoices about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says this is the miracle, this is the wonderful thing about it. When we preached, you believed. That's a miracle. How did it happen? It happened by a work of the Holy Spirit, a work of God's grace, that God the Holy Spirit leapt upon those words of the gospel and took those words and caused those words to penetrate the conscience and the heart of those listeners and to quicken those hearts and to bring those hearts alive and to awaken faith and to create faith in the person so that when somebody lifts their hands in a meeting and says, yes, I want Jesus, or when they come forward and pray the prayer of salvation, or when they go like the woman of Samaria and say, come, I want to tell you something marvelous has happened to me. Or like Zacchaeus who said, I'm going to sell my possessions, I'm going to give to the poor and if I've cheated you, I'm going to pay you back many, many times over. Then we know that the Spirit of God has been at work because there's been prayer, there's been intercession and the Spirit of God has been released. Prayer softens the hearts of people and prepares the soil for the preaching of the Word of God. That's why in our church services, at all times, there are intercessors. Did you know in every service that I have preached in, in this church, in every service, there have been people praying for me throughout the entire service, both in the service and outside of the service. I never stand up to preach without people praying for me before, during, and afterwards. Hallelujah. And you know what? I, I pray too. I pray too. Don't worry about it. I pray. Yes, I do. But what I like to do is I like to come and I like to get up here and mount the prayers of God's people. And it's a wonderful feeling of Holy Ghost security. Thank you, Jesus. And I have my eye out for the intercessors. And there they are. Some of them have learned how to pray. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. They've, 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 they've learned how to pray. And there they are, smiling away. And you know, underneath the, the surface, it's like the, the duck, duck's feet paddling away like this. 
And some of them haven't learned that yet, and so this is how they pray in a public meeting. And there they are, praying like this, and the person next to them saying, what's the matter with those person, with these people? But the fact is, they're praying. And we need to know this. All of our evangelistic teams run along this principle. When we go out on missions teams, I take intercessors. In fact, I'm known all over the world. When I go, I don't bring an entourage. I bring intercessor, intercessors with me. They're not those to carry my bags and make cups of tea. Though a few cups of tea are quite welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, but, but it's more than that. They come with me. They come to support my arms in prayer. So when I stand up to preach, and there's a tough demonic manifestation, we're praying in the birthplace of voodoo, we're preaching the gospel, and there they are praying. And there's powerful encounters and the Holy Spirit's working, and the people are praying. Evangelism and intercession go hand in hand. They're like two wings of an aeroplane. And so when we pray for the lost to be saved, we are listening to God to establish which disciple or disciples or person he wants to use to reach out to those people and we need to pray specifically and persistently for God to equip those disciples to and empower them with words of grace and favor now I know that God honors the simple sincere praying Lord please save the lost but such prayers you know they're not a waste of time but they're usually lazy praying Lord save England amen that's lazy praying Lord save Europe Amen. Well, you might as well just pray, Lord, save the world and go home. If that's, what you're, if that's how you're going to pray, it's lazy praying. We need to learn to wrestle in prayer and to engage in prayer. Not to persuade a reluctant God to save recalcitrant sinners, but to pray to a God who says, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he may send out laborers. And that means effective laborers, laborers like Jesus who went about preaching, healing and delivering. Laborers who will do the work of Jesus Christ with all his anointing, with all his power.